All right. Um, thank you, Fela. Um, I don't see my picture up there, but hopefully everybody can hear my voice. <laughs> um, so our very special guest speaker today is Linda Cochran. And Linda has been an avid gardener for 40 years and is well known in horticultural circles for lush and colorful landscapes she has created at her former home on Ban Bainbridge Island. And now she has a garden on the eastern edge of the Olympic Peninsula in Port Ludlow. I first met Linda on a hike out to Badger Valley in Olympic National Park and have also been fortunate to share botanical adventures with her at Mount Rainier. It is from wild landscapes like those that Linda gets much of her inspiration for her garden designs, as well as stunning digital paintings that she creates from her photographs, like the one you see here today. I think that's a wild landscape, not a garden. Is that right, Linda, or is this your garden? No, that's from Mount Rainier. That's from this, this picture on your screen is from Mount Rainier. <laughs> So today's presentation is titled Propagation of Native Plants for Pacific Northwest Gardens and will focus on growing castileas, commonly known as Indian paintbrush, and pedicularis, also known as louseworts, from seeds. Linda is undaunted by the complexities of propagation and planting, as evidenced by the incredible diversity in her home garden, which is a combination of Pacific Northwest natives and plants from around the world. And I've been very fortunate to uh, visit that garden and get a few plants from her for my own garden. For Linda's presentation today, like uh, Fela said, if you have questions, you can put post them in the chat or in the Q&A section and we'll, uh, Linda will have time to address those hopefully at the end of the program. So thank you so much for Linda for being here tonight and I'll let you take it away. <laughs> Well, you're welcome, Kathy. And uh, I was asked to give this talk on propagation of Pacific Northwest or plant Pacific Northwest native plants for the garden. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little narrower than that. I'm going to talk about seed growing of plants that I find garden worthy uh, that are native plants. And I'm not going to cover the whole range of native plants and how to propagate them. I'm only going to talk about seed growing. And I think there are basically three reasons why you would want to grow plants from seed, native plants. One is to obtain plants that you can't get anywhere else. For example, in the picture here, the yellow flower is a plant called Rhaenyra stricta, which is unavailable in the trade. Uh, and it's a plant that you would have to grow from seed if you wanted it in your garden. But it's definitely a very garden worthy plant. A second reason is to obtain mass quantities of the plant. As you see here uh, in most of the uh, landscapes in Washington that I particularly enjoy, there are usually quite a few of any one particular plant. And if you're gonna buy all those plants from a nursery, you'd soon be bankrupt. So the thing to do is to grow them from seed and get mass quantities, either that or rely on self-sowing. And finally, a third reason to grow from seed, of course, is just for the fun of it. I find that growing from seed is probably the most rewarding thing, the most rewarding activity I can do in the garden. So uh, let's get down to it. Uh, and I'm gonna talk first about the setup I use for growing seed. And then I'm gonna talk about particular types of seed that I've grown and some of the tricks involved. So this is my seed setup. It doesn't look any, you know, very uh, impressive, but what this is, is uh, sandwiches of Anderson Flats. And Anderson Flats are uh, heavy duty, uh, fairly large flats that are available in the Pacific Northwest. Mostly they're available from the Anderson Company, or if you Google Anderson Flats, you'll find where they're sold. Um, I've gotten all of mine from friends who have given them to me. I have friends in the nursery business or for, friends formerly in the nursery business and, and they've given me these flats. So there are seed pots in all of these sandwiches and I'll show you more information about them later. Um, and I should notice note that you don't have to grow this way. You can grow uh, 
in cold frames, or you can grow in any situation where you have some protection over the top of the seed pots to protect them from the critters, from mice and from birds eating the seeds. So here's a closer view of these Anderson flat sandwiches. And I've, I put them together with binder clips. These binder clips are found on Amazon. You just put in binder clips and you get them. They're usually used by lawyers. And uh, these are on top of benches that I got at um, Costco. So these are metal benches. Um, if you uh, use these metal benches, you should be aware that they're metal and therefore they retain heat more than wood. If I were doing this now, I might try for wooden benches instead of metal because of that fact. So there's a closer up picture of an Anderson flat. These are heavy duty flats that will last a very, very long time. They're not particularly cheap, but they do last a long time. And this is a normal flat. Um, and you could use two of these normal flats to make a sandwich out of them. You notice on this particular one, the holes are fairly small, but they're a lot bigger than they are on the Anderson flats. Holes of this size would allow birds to peck through and peck out seeds because I've had that happen to me in the past. So you actually don't wanna use this type of flat. Besides Anderson flats, you could use um, hardware cloth. I've known people who have done that over the tops of their seeds. And there's a closer look at the binder clip. And in one of these Anderson flat sandwiches, you can get 20 of these uh, three and a half inch pots. And that's how I do my seeds. Each type of seed is in a pot like this. And uh, often from one package of seed, I may get more than one pot, but um, these are three and a half inch pots. And if you go to order them or buy them, three and a half inch is the type you want. Oh, and I should add that the reason you need protection from critters and from the uh, animals, uh, the birds, is that what you're gonna do with your seed is you're gonna sow it in the winter time or the fall and you're gonna leave it outside until it comes up. And so it, it's a lengthy time that these are usually left outside, a matter of months. And the type of mix that I use for most of my seed is a cactus mix. And this is the brand of cactus mix that I use. You don't have to use this particular brand and you don't have to use cactus mix. I like cactus mix because it's well-drained and because it holds up over time. If you use what is normally used for growing veg, um, it doesn't hold up over time. And these plants usually requires a year or more in the pot growing on before they're planted out. So you, you don't want a, a mix that deteriorates and you want a mix for most of the plants that I'm gonna talk about, you want a mix that's well-drained. Some people just use the normal seed growing mix uh, that's used for veg, and then they add a third of sand and a third of grit. And that again is, is a perfectly acceptable mix to use. I found that, that there's no magic about the mix that you use, but you want one that's well-drained and you want one that will hold up over time. And this is what this particular cactus mix looks like. It's not, in my, to my eye, very cactusy looking. <laughs> they changed the formulation on this mix uh, from a couple years ago. I think they ended using peat. They no longer use peat in the mix at all. So that's why it looks so dark because they're using wood products mainly. And here's the analysis. As you can see, it, it is mainly wood products. And I know a lot of nurseries that grow a lot of um, these types of plants use a wood product based um, potting mix. So this isn't far off from what a lot of people use. This is a more normal seed starting mix uh, that we would use for veg. I would just stay away from this mix altogether. You just simply do not use it for native plants. And as you can see by the ingredients on the type for veg, there's a lot of peat in it which is something you wanna stay away from. Uh, another 
uh, mix that you could use is just regular potting soil. This potting soil from the looks of the ingredients looks very similar to the cactus mix. It's also a wood products based mix. And for some of the seeds that I grow, particularly those that like a lot of moisture, I use this potting soil mix and I often mix sand in with it. And some of the mix, some of the stuff I use, especially for um, moisture loving plants like Pedicularis greenlandica, I use this with the half sand because sand uh, holds water. And then uh, another ingredient you need for your seed starting is poultry grit. Um, I put poultry grit on top of all my seed pots. And this is not chicken grit, it's poultry grit, which is a fairly um, large grit. It's, it doesn't, it, I've bought chicken grit before and chicken grit is too fine a base. Uh, and this year I've somewhat switched up my technique and I've put in about half of the pot with the cactus mix and then half with the grit. And I'm sowing the seeds then on top of that. And then for most of them, I add a very light layer of grit on top of the seeds. And another thing to remember when you're growing these seeds is to label every single pot. Uh, you're going to have a problem if you don't do that. And you have to label with a, with a pencil that will not uh, fade. Uh, the pencil that I, and, and this is an example of one that I use, and this is what I put on the label. I put the name of the plant, I put where the seed company is that I got the, the seed from, or if I got it from someplace else where I got the seed, and the date that I sowed it. And so this is my sort of labeling uh, gear. The pencils I've been using are uh, sketching pencils because they uh, seem to last quite a long time. Um, a pencil sharpener and labels. And I get most of the labels that I use from Amazon. Um, I found that if you go to a nursery and try to buy plant labels, they don't have very good plant labels available in, the, in most nurseries. And another piece of equipment I use is a uh, seed tray. Well, this isn't actually called the seed tray, but you get it from a place like Gardener's Supply and they're boot trays, very sturdy trays. And I just do all my seed sowing in this tray. Uh, and I usually try to sow four pots of seed a day starting in November. And uh, by the time this time of the year comes around, I've done most of the seed sowing I'm gonna do for the year. And the final thing you need for sowing seed is um, fertilizer. Uh, it makes a big difference in your seed growing that you fertilize the seedlings once they start growing. And I use a light uh, liquid fertilizer and I use this particular brand, but there's no magic to it. It's just a brand that seems to work very well. I've been using it for years. It never hurts the plants in any way. It's an organic brand. Um, but you can use almost any brand. But I found with many of the seedlings that I grow, they do a whole lot better if they are fertilized and once a week or once every two weeks is not too often. So uh, the next topic that moving on from the seed setup is where do you get your seeds if you wanna grow natives? Um, well, one source that I've used is Northwest Meadowscapes. I think their office is located in Port Townsend. Uh, they have very good seed. I found that all their seed germinates extremely well. And they have seed mainly uh, native to the lowlands of uh, the Puget Sound region. So it's a good one if you live in this particular area. Um, another one also in Port Townsend is Inside Passage Seeds. They have very good seeds also. Another seed company I use quite a bit is Klamath Siskiyou Native Seeds. Uh, they're located down um, in Ashland. And of course the name gives away where their seeds are from, but a lot of the seeds are seeds that, of plants that the same species are native here. They are collected though in the Siskiyou region. But some of the plants that they have are plants that seeds of the particular species are available only from them. 
Another source I use is one called Geoscapes Desert Nursery. And this is, this guy is located in Idaho and he collects seeds all over the Eastern uh, part of our state and Oregon and Nevada and Idaho. And so he collects a lot of seed that I don't find anywhere else. Um, and a lot of, you know, desert type seed, but I'm interested in those types of seed also. So he's a good source and I found his seed to be a very, also very good. Another source I use is Native Ideals, which is in Montana. Um, they uh, specialize in Montana native seeds. And again, many of the species that are native to Montana are also native here, especially in the Eastern part of our state. And uh, one particular species they have, which I don't find many other places is uh, Lewisia rediviva, which is the Montana native plant anyway. So of course you get it from Montana, but um, the only other place I know of to get Lewisia rediviva, which grows quite commonly in the Eastern part of our state is uh, from a German company called Gelido. And I found that Gelido, uh, Lewisia rediviva is not Lewisia rediviva, it's some other Lewisia. So you wanna get, if you wanna grow that species, you sort of need to get it from this company. Another good company is Western Native Seeds and they are in Colorado. Again, many of the species that they sell are species which are native to our state, but again, they are not collected from our state. They're collected in Colorado and, and Rocky Mountain regions. Uh, this, for example, Pedicularis Greenlandica, there is no seed seller in Washington that sells Washington collected seeds. So if you wanna grow this seed, you're gonna to have to get it from someplace like Western Native Seed. Another good source is All Plains. All Plains is a company in Colorado and uh, he collected seed all over the West, including in Washington state. Um, and so he still has some on his seed list. He is gradually phasing out his business, but it's going to be a big loss because he had one of the best seed lists of anyone uh, in the West. So if you wanna order from All Plains this year, maybe the last year you can do it. Another company is Miss Penn's Mountain Seed. And I found this is, this company also from Colorado has some seed that is not available elsewhere of some species that are native to Washington state, but again, they're not collected in Washington state. For example, she has a Pedicularis species, which is native to Washington State, also native in the Rockies. No seed seller in Washington State sells this seed. So if you want to grow this species, you have to get it from her. Larner Seeds in California specializes in California annuals and some perennials. Uh, but men, again, many of the annuals she uh, sells are, an, are species which are also native here but again, they're not collected here. And finally, a very good source for seed is the North American Rock Garden Society uh, Seed Exchange, um, which has usually a fairly good list of wild collected uh, seeds that are native to the West Coast. Uh, for example, this Olsinium, uh, which was collected in Victoria. So that's, those are uh, basic uh, seed sources. I should mention while I'm still on the subject of seed sources that uh, there's also a Penstemon Society. And if, you, if you're interested in Penstemons, that's the best place to get Penstemons is through their seed exchange. They have a very extensive seed exchange uh, with it, just about every Penstemon you could imagine on their list. They also have other native plants on their list. So it's a good place to get things. Um, and finally, I should mention I, that there are no um, seed collectors that I know of in the central part of Washington state. Uh, you have a couple of seed sellers who sell seeds that are native to the lowland regions of Puget Sound and the Olympic Peninsula. You have some sellers who sell seed native to the far eastern part of the state because they live in Idaho. Uh, 
Uh, but there are no seed collectors that I know of collecting seed in the central part of Washington state, uh, which I think is a big uh, blank spot in uh, seed production for native seed. So let's talk about some of the specific seeds that I really like. And this is my big pet is Castilleas. I'm a big Castilleas aficionado. And this particular one is Castilleja miniata, which was the first one I grew. And I grew it because I bought some, some plants from a local native plant uh, nursery. And I planted a few of those. And then I got some more from my wholesale nursery in Oregon, um, Seven Oaks native plants. And I should mention that Seven Oaks native plants has a lot of interesting native plants on their list that they sell wholesale. Uh, and Castileas are one of them, Castilea miniata. They grow Castilea miniata by the thousands. They grow Castilea miniata in pots, in small pots without a host. And when you buy them, I've bought flats of them from them and they establish quite well in the garden. So that lays to rest any idea that you have to have a host to, to start Castileas or to get them established in the garden. So this is a miniata that uh, was a self-sown one in my garden. And it turns out that Castilea miniata is probably one of the best ones to start with if you're starting growing Castilleas. It's widespread. It grows in the Puget Sound lowlands. It grows in the mountains. Uh, it uh, has quite a, it, it goes quite a bit farther south than uh, Washington and quite a bit farther east. Very, very wide range and uh, very diverse habitats that it will grow in. This is uh, Castilea levisecta, and I mentioned this one because this is uh, Castilea levisecta at uh, Finley Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. And you can see there are quite a few of them here. This uh, Castilea was extirpated in Oregon and it was reintroduced over the last 20 years or so into Oregon. And it's, it's been a success story there. There are a number of places where it now has large populations such as this one at Finley. And the reason I mentioned this is Castilea in connection with that reintroduction program, um, Castilea levisecta was extensively studied and thousands of plants of Castilea levisecta were uh, produced from seed and they were grown from seed without a host initially. Uh, again, putting to rest the idea that you have to have a host when you sow the seeds of a Castilea. You simply do not. Uh, they, I have grown many species of Castileas and I never grow them with the host initially. What they did in this uh, reintroduction program is they grew them without a host. At some point in their growing, they reintroduced them to a host and then they planted them out. And I think they have concluded that the best way actually to get these established now is just to sow the seed directly. And that's my conclusion about a lot of Castileas. Uh, speaking of Castilea miniata, there are places where you can see millions of them. One of them being at Mount St. Helens. This is near Johnston Ridge. And the, the orange Castileas you see at Johnston Ridge or scarlet ones are all Castilea miniata with um, Penstemon cardwellii. Another Castilea that you see a lot of around here in the mountains is Castilea parviflora bar op opala. This one is the one you see at Mount Rainier. This is a paradise. And again, if you uh, go there often, you will know that there are millions of these Castileas there. And this Castilea is one that seems to like fairly moist conditions. Uh, Miniata will take fairly dry conditions as you see by it growing at Mount St. Helens, which is growing on ash, not a particularly wet habitat. In my garden though, Miniata seems to do the best in fairly uh, rich, wet soil. Not, not, not wet in terms of bogginess, but moist soil. I also assume that Parviflora bar aureopola requires moist soil or would like moist soil. 
And this is Castilea miniata naturalized in my garden. Uh, I let these self sow and I have hundreds of them in my garden now. And so this is a list of all the Castilea species that I've grown from seed. And in none of these did I sow them with a host. I, I have seen so many um, instructions <laughs> that come with Castilea saying, well, here's a package of a seed you can sow with it so you have a host to go with it. You don't need to do that. Uh, you just sow them like any other plant and they come up, usually if the seed is good, they come up like gangbusters. Um, I, I found that I sow the, if I sow the seed in the winter in the regime I've just, just described, um, they all come up. And I don't think I've ever had any packet of Castileas uh, not germinate at all. The only time they don't germinate in the first year you sow them is if you sow them too late in the season. Uh, I would not sow any Castileas after January. Uh, in the past, when I've tried to sow them after January, they didn't come up that year, they would come up the following year. So here's an example of Castileas coming up like gangbusters without a host. This is uh, Castilea and what the seller said was Angustifolia bardubia, which apparently is the same as Chromosa. And this came up I, way too thickly. If I had known it was come, would come up like this, I probably would not have sown it so thickly. And there it is as it gets a little bigger. And this is uh, Castilea parviflora var oreopola, the magenta paintbrush from Mount Rainier. There's a similar one from uh, the Olympics, but that's Castilea parviflora var olympica. And it's, the flower is not quite as big as the flower of the uh, one at Mount Rainier. And it, often Castileas will bloom in the pots without a host in the first year after sowing. This is the Castilea cromosa. Um, and this particular population had a lot of variation in the seed color. Some were salmony, some were um, orange, and some were pink. And it, it makes a very pleasing uh, color contrast. And this is uh, Castilea rexifolia, again, blooming in the first year after sowing. Castilea rexifolia is one that's native in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it appears to me that it's very similar in its habitat requirements to parviflora. Uh, and uh, I got seed. I had to go all the way to Germany to get this seed <laughs> because the only source I could find at the time was from Gelito, which is a German seed company. This again is Rexifolia growing in the pot in the first year from seed. And this is Applegatii, uh, Castilea Applegatii, which comes fr from the Siskiyou region. And more uh, Rexifolias growing in the pot. This is Thompsonii, which is a very common Castilea in Eastern Washington. This is a, a more Applegatii. One thing I've found with Castileas is I now, I no longer try to prick them out in the first year that they're growing. Um, you have heavy losses if you do that. Um, Castileas seem in, in very, very, um, sensitive to lack of water until they have established a connection with the host. So I have lost more Castileas from lack of water than anything else. And so to avoid this and to avoid tiny plants being pricked out into their own pots and then dying, uh, I generally leave the, the Castileas in the pot for one year. And it's only after the second year that I take them out of the pot and put them in their own pots and or, and or put them in the ground. And when I put them in the ground, I try to put them near a host and the host can be almost anything. I don't, I don't, I don't try to 
figure out what host they would have. I just put them near another plant because I found that they're not particularly picky about hosts. They just need to be near another plant. Uh, at least most of them are not particularly picky about hosts. Uh, and usually that, that does the trick. And the other plant doesn't even have to be a native plant. Uh, the first uh, castaleas that I ever planted in my garden, I planted near Stipa gigantea, which is a grass from Spain. And they are still there and still living. And they have produced lots of seedlings. So these are that was this picture is a second year seedling of uh, Castalea uh, applegadii. And it looks like there may be some uh, additional germination going on from that sowing that produced this plant. And then this is Castalea parviflora or oreopola, second year seedlings. And this is a picture of seedlings that came up this year. Just uh, I just noticed these a few weeks ago. This is Castalea sessiliflora. Uh, this is from, I think, all plain seed. You see how tiny they are when they first come up. When I sow Castalea seeds, they're, they're very tiny. And I sow them on top of all the, uh, the grit that I've put in the pot. And then I put a thin layer, very thin layer of grit on top. I suppose you could get by with not putting anything on top of them at all because uh, they're so tiny that surface sowing is probably the way to go with them. And certainly if you sow them directly, that's all you need to do is just surface sow them. This is one I did direct. So this is uh, Castalia Integra. Uh, this is common in the Rocky Mountain region in Colorado and other states. Uh, this one actually did very well in sort of a sandy, fairly arid bed in my garden. But uh, this is a plant that was direct sown in the same year that it's, it is uh, blooming. This is Castalia exerta, which is a California and Southwestern native. There are places in California where there are fields of this and it's just gorgeous. Um, this is an annual Castalia. And I direct sowed this and uh, the first year I direct sowed it, I sowed quite a few seeds. And the, those seeds then self sowed. And so I had this Castalia from self sowing by itself in the garden for about five or six years. And then it sort of petered out. So last year I sowed some more seeds of it and gratifyingly they came up. So. Uh, this is another one to self to uh, direct sow. And in fact, because it's an annual, uh, I would be really wary about growing this in pots. I think probably direct sowing it is the way to go. And this is a castalia that popped up in the garden. And it took me a while to figure out that it's rexifolia uh, from a direct sowing I did a few years ago. And it's growing. Uh, through the base and, and on a sage, uh, Salvia pachyphyla. Uh, so it seems to like that situation. But again, showing that most castaleas will do fine with direct sowing. The main problem with that is that you have to know what you sowed <laughs> and you have to know that when you have something coming up there that that's a castalea because they look, they don't have a very distinctive look when they're first coming up and it would be easy to weed them out. This is showing, I have red, red uh, outlines around Castalia seedlings. So you, this is Castalia miniata, self-sown seedlings in the garden. And you see how tiny they are and how they're not particularly um, noteworthy. So if you don't know what they look like, it's easy to weed them out. Um, and that would be a reason never to hire a gardener because the gardener surely would weed them out and that would be tragic. So that's Castalias. Uh, and going back to Castalias, the thing I sh should say to everybody is that Castalias are plants. You just treat them like plants. Uh, don't get spooked by the fact that they're hemiparasitic. And, and I should mention that they are not true parasites. They're hemiparasitic, which means they have roots.
live broadcast has stopped. Is the live broadcast still going? Yes, we're trying to. Hi, Linda. Um, I'm here. We froze for a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get a uh, sign. Our that participants says, are still here. So this is Denise. Okay. Go ahead and uh, share. Just your say okay again. Okay, do you still do you see the screen? Not yet. Okay, let me start with share screen again. Okay. We see you now. Okay. There we go. We're back. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Back to your presentation. Thank okay, you. do you see it? Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Okay, we're on the oral, we're still on the Oral Bank ACA family. Uh, Castellia is our member, and so are particularists. And uh, so particularists are another pet of mine. And uh, they are also hemiparasitic, just like Castellias. And so everything I said about growing Castellias also applies to Pedicularis. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Logan Valley, Oregon. This is between the towns of John Day and uh, Burns. If you know anything about Eastern Oregon, you know that that is way out in the boon boondocks. This is near uh, the Strawberry Mountains, the mountains that you see in the background, and it's at about 5,000 feet. This is the most particularist Greenlandica I've ever seen in one place. It's just amazing. Highly recommend visiting it if you haven't. And there they are again. That with I've noticed, I've seen particularist Greenlandica in many places, usually at higher elevations, uh, 5,000 feet. For example, with this one, uh, they're not really alpine, more subalpine, I would say, but uh, usually in very wet meadow conditions. Uh, there's a big population of them near Reflection Lake in uh, near Mount Rainier. But most of the ones I see are not quite as saturated a color as the ones I saw in Logan Valley. Uh, so, and of course, in my garden, I want the most saturated color I can find. And so there's a close-up. These are sometimes called elephant's head uh, lousewort because if you look very closely at the individual flowers, they look like elephant's heads. And so I have succeeded in growing this in my garden. Uh, this is one flowering in my garden and it's flowering by uh, Castalia. They often do grow near Castellias. And this uh, sort of feathery foliage is one that self-sowed in my garden. I have I direct sowed this into the garden and it uh, grew from a direct sowing. But you have to keep in mind that if you are gonna direct sow this into the garden, you need a fairly moist spot. They don't like it too dry. And when you see them, in the wild, they're in fairly marshy conditions. Another one that self-sowed. And then I've also grown them in pots. Uh, they do fine there. And I, I first was clued into the fact that you can grow these in mass quantities from seed. Um, because Seven Oaks natives had them as, as uh, a wholesale crop once. And so if they can be grown wholesale, uh, certainly they're grow growable by home gardeners. And I, I showed, when I was showing seed sources, I showed uh, a packet of these from Western native seeds, uh, which is a good place to get uh, seeds of these. Another particularis that uh, everybody lusts after is Pedicularis densiflora. This one, uh, its northernmost population is in Southern Oregon in, Grant, in Grants Pass. Otherwise it goes down into California. Mostly, most of the populations are in California, but it's, it's a, just a, an absolutely beautiful plant. I found that it, it actually germinates quite easily 
getting it to survive after it germinates is a more difficult proposition. There's seedlings and you notice uh, it germinates quite readily and you can see some of the uh, more adult uh, leaves are starting to come out on these seedlings. Uh, and then as in the wild, this plant blooms fairly early. I've, I've been hearing reports of blooming of Pedicularis densiflora in California right now. And uh, I've even seen that the population that this picture was taken of, which is in Grants Pass, uh, there it's starting to bloom. And so this is pretty early. Uh, this picture wasn't taken until I think late March. And so late March, early April is probably the, the normal time when these would be blooming. So if you grow them from seed, the leaves come up and they do well until a little after March, maybe a month or two after that, and then they go dormant during the summer. And then they come up in the second year again. And I've had them do that, um, but so far I haven't been successful in introducing them into the garden. Um, they require, uh, they, they normally grow with Arctostaphylus, with um, um, Madronas, with oaks in woodland conditions. And uh, it's thought that they're using the roots of the uh, Arctostaphylus and other uh, denizens of that woodland for their, for their substance, uh, for their host. Uh, so what I'm planning to do with these next is to sow them in a pot of an Arctostaphylus and see if that works. I think a direct sowing would work uh, if you can get them in the proper uh, habitat and there are lots of other pedicularis uh, in Washington that would make good garden plants if seed were ever available. This is uh, bird's beak pedicularis or pedicularis ornithorhynchus. Uh, this is uh, quite common in sunrise area of Mount Rainier. And this is pedicularis contorta, also common at the sunrise area of Mount Rainier and Pedicularis rainierensis, not so common, uh, but up near, this was also taken in the sunrise area. And uh, this is a fairly common one, um, not just in Washington, but in other states, this is Pedicularis bracteosa. And when you see it by itself, I think most people would think, well, that's okay, but what's so great about that? But with other plants, it's pretty good. So it's one, it's a, it's a fairly large pedicularis. Uh, as you can see, it's standing above some of the other surrounding plants. This picture was taken at Berkeley Park in Mount Rainier. And so I got some seeds from Miss Penns. Uh, I showed you a picture of her packet. Uh, she is uh, in Colorado. So these seeds were collected in Colorado. I don't know of anybody in Washington who's collecting seeds of this particular particularis, but it certainly is growable. So we're done with the oral bancaceas. Uh, let's move on to another one of my favorites, and that is Lomatium columbianum. Um, everybody in the world drools over Lomatium columbianum, I must tell you. Uh, and they all would like to grow it, it seems. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, uh, found in a fairly narrow area in the Columbia Gorge. This picture was taken at Rowena. Another picture also at Rowena. And these are all Lomatium columbianums in my garden. I love this plant so much. I have probably 25 or 30 of them in my garden. And they're finally reaching a size where they make an impact. They, I should tell you that this Lomatium is very, very slow growing. Uh, I'm told that uh, analyses have been done on the roots of some of the Eastern Oregon Lomatiums, or Eastern Washington Lomatiums, and they can be very, very old, uh, in excess even of 100 years old. And I'm sure they have exceedingly large root systems. Here's one in my garden now. Um, Sometimes these Lomatiums flower before the leaves come up. 
And so this is Lomatium columbianum seedlings. They are very easy from seed actually. They have very large seeds. So when you sow the seeds, you want to cover the seeds. Uh, and so I cover the seeds with the uh, chicken grit. And these are sowed in um, the three and a half inch pots. But I found that Lomatiums have very long root systems. And so it might be advisable to sow maybe two or three seeds in a very long, tall pot. Uh, eight or nine inches tall wouldn't be too tall because that would allow the seed, the, the roots to grow down. And that would allow you to keep the plant in the same pot without having to transplant it. When you plant them, when you sow them in these three and a half inch pots, you're gonna to have to uh, pot them up in the first year after sowing, uh, or otherwise their roots are just gonna to be totally mashed by the pot. So, and, I, and another point I should make is that the seed for the, in these pots came from Gelito, which is the German seed company, which has a number of native uh, plants, United States plants. And I don't know of many other places in the, in the United States where you can get Lomatium columbianum seeds. Uh, so it's one of those plants where we should have local seed companies selling the seed, but we don't. And so that's why we have to go to Gelito to get seed. And so these are seedlings, the same seedlings that you saw in the last picture after they were potted up. And the, that, that's this year, they're coming up. Um, I found that some of them come up early and some of them come up later. So if you don't see anything in a pot right away, that doesn't necessarily mean that the plant is there. Uh, but these uh, I found are quite easy from seed. And in fact, you could just put the seed in the ground where you want them to grow. And uh, like as not, they will grow there. Uh, you sort of have to know where you, where you put them. And if I were doing that, I would probably put say three seeds in one particular position in case not all of them came up, but they're, they're easy from seed, uh, easy to grow. The main problem is when they're young, the slugs love them. So you have to protect them from that. Uh, and they, they like fairly well-drained conditions. So again, don't plant them in an area where you would be growing things like delphiniums or peonies. Uh, you want them in a fairly dry condition, just like they have in the Columbia Gorge on the Eastern part of the Columbia Gorge. So moving on from that, um, Another one I love is phacelias, and there are a lot of phacelias. Uh, this is my favorite. This is phacelia um, cerasia. This is up on Hurricane Hill in the uh, Olympic National Park, and it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant, and this is right on top of Hurricane Hill, and so it's growing in the rocks there, uh, and that gives you a clue that this likes very, very well-drained soil. But like all phacelias, and I grow a number of them, it's easy, extremely easy from seed. Uh, this is one growing in my garden. And that brings me to another reason why growing from seed is so good, because sometimes you have to experiment with a plant in your garden to know where it would do well. Uh, and even though I'm an experienced gardener, uh, I had to grow this plant in probably six or seven different places in my garden before I figured out where it would do well. And I, if you bought every single plant that you put in those six or seven places, uh, it would be expensive. So if you grow them from seed, you're free to experiment, which is what I've done. And I just show this picture because it's said by rock gardeners and, and this particular facelia is, is liked by rock gardeners. Uh, that the Olympic uh, form of Thacelia cerasia is particularly good. The foliage is very, very blue as compared to other uh, forms of this plant. And so on the left-hand side, you see six plants of Thacelia cerasia from the, Olympic, from the Olympics. And on the right-hand side, Thacelia cerasia from Western native seeds, which presumably is a Rocky Mountain form of Thacelia cerasia. And you can see the difference in foliage. But there is no trick to growing Phacelia cerasia. If you 
you plant them in the way I've described planting any plants, you put them on top of the, the grit, you put a little bit of grit on top of that and just let them be over the winter and they lo and behold will come up and they come up like gangbusters because all phacelias do that it seems. This is a phacelia um, idahoensis, which was the seed was given to me by Alexander Wright. Uh, and this is, uh, looks sort of like Phacelia serracea on steroids, but it, it's a nice plant. Also likes very well-drained soil and also is perennial. Phacelia californica, um, native to California, more on the coast. And I grew this from seed that I scattered. And uh, phacelias do that. <laughs> In fact, sometimes they're over enthusiastic about where they want to grow, including this one, uh, which grows everywhere once you get it established. But it's much loved by the bees as most phacelias are. And phacelia linearia folia, this is an annual phacelia. This picture was taken sort of on the uh, scab lands near Bend. Uh, and I finally found some seed of this uh, from Northwest Meadowscapes. I think I showed you a seed packet of this. So this is an annual, and I assume that it would grow uh, just by direct sowing. That would be the best way to grow it. I've grown a lot of species of annual phacelias just by direct sowing. So moving on from phacelias, uh, another one of my favorites is astragalus. This is astragalus persei, uh, and astragalus is in the Fabaceae family. Um, pea family, uh, and there are a lot of great plants in that family, but I've found of all the plants I've ever grown, this is one of the most difficult to get going other than Pedicularis densiflora. Uh, this picture was taken near uh, Yakima and it's growing in an old pasture. So it's not growing in rocks, even though most people can think of these as rock garden plants, they do grow in fairly dry conditions. It's not a big plant. It's uh, maybe five or six inches across. And while I'm at it, even though this isn't a Pacific Northwest native, while we're on the subject of astragalus, I thought I'd just throw in the picture of the Holy Grail of astragalus, which is astragalus coccinius. This was a picture taken down on the road up to Idlewild from Palm Springs. Uh, but again, a relative astragalus to astragalus persei. If you could ever grow that one, you, your job as a gardener would be done. So these are astragalus persei seedlings. These came up this year. Uh, sometimes it said that in order to get astragalus to germinate, you need to nick the seeds. That's often said about members of the Fabaceae family, but I found that they don't need nicking. You, they grow, they germinate well enough without any special treatment. Uh, this was from seed from Geoscapes, uh, native plant nursery. Uh, the guy in Idaho, uh, he collected these, I think somewhere in um, probably Malheur County, Oregon. And this is last year's crop of, particular, of Astragalus persei. So they do come up quite well. There's no problem there. And I'm also told that astragalus seedlings can be quite old and still germinate quite well. And so what I did, and I've tried to grow astragalus many, many times and after many failures, um, I potted them individually into clay pots because drainage is critical to these. And I added a lot of grit and sand to the mix that I planted them in. And so these are all individually potted from this, these uh, pots of seedlings. And uh, many of them are still alive, although they're mostly dormant at the moment. Uh, they should be starting to grow because I uh, have heard that they are starting to grow in places like Cottonwood Canyon right now. They're fairly early plants uh, in certain areas. In other areas, not so early though. I've seen them, for example, um, over in eastern, uh, northeastern Oregon in June. So I think it depends on where they're growing as to how early they are. But the ones in Cottonwood Canyon are quite early. And there's a close up. 
And the thing about these, all these in the pots, I grew them like this all last summer and they had nice foliage, did very well. And they seem to appreciate being watered. Uh, and my theory as to why that is, because in the wild, they wouldn't be watered and they require really uh, well-drained soil. They grow in, in kind of desert conditions almost. And uh, in the wild, I'm sure they have very, very long roots. Uh, here in the pots, they're not able to have such long roots. And I've, I have actually killed more astragalus from lack of water than anything else, just like some castileas. Just goes to show you that sometimes when you grow plants in pots, they have different requirements than when they're growing in the wild. But the thing that the thing that often gets these is wet in the winter time. In the summer, and when they're actively growing, water them, they're, they're fine that way, fertilize them, they're fine that way. But in the winter, they don't wanna be wet. And I found that the best way to, to deal with that situation is to not over pot them when you first pot them up. So these pots are fairly small that they're in. If I put them in too big a pot thinking their roots needed a long run, they generally will die over the winter. So here you see one now and you see at the center of it, you see that it's alive. So hopefully it will grow, start growing soon. So uh, I put, there are several members uh, of the Fabaceae family, which I think probably have very similar requirements in how they grow. Uh, so Hedysterum is another one. This is Hedysterum occidentale. This is taken up on Hurricane Hill. Uh, this is another pea family member that would be good to grow and would probably have very similar requirements to how it grows as to the astragalus. And there are also um, ox oxytropsis, which are also very similar uh, in terms of their requirements. Uh, so I always put those three species together uh, or types of species, astragalus, hedysarum, and oxytropsis in terms of how, how you grow them. So uh, let's move on to the Brassicaceae family because it seems that when you're talking about growing plants from seed, usually plants in the same family have sort of similar requirements. So I found that all members of the Brassicaceae that I've tried to grow have been very, very easy. And this is uh, Phenicolis uh, charanthoides or sometimes called dagger pod. And this is one of my favorite uh, plants. This is fairly common in the eastern scablands of Washington. Um, I did a trip out to um, where the where the windmill, the wind, there's a wind farm in central central Washington, and there's a number of places you can go there. Uh, and this was near the wind farm. And there were these every few feet. Uh, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant with the blue foliage, the nice flowers. And very, very dry country. There were um, cactuses growing here, uh, things that liked dryness, dry, dry scab land. And so you would think that these plants in a garden would require dryness. Uh, this is in the, pointing out one feature of these plants. In the summer, the foliage is blue like this. In the winter, it's green. Just an interesting factoid about them. But I found that when I planted these in my garden, they survived in the driest parts of my garden, but they didn't do much. They didn't grow much. They didn't, certainly didn't flower, certainly didn't make foliage like this, but they've survived. Uh, I now have started growing them in pots where I water them just like I watered the astragalus more often than I would if they were growing in the ground and they do fine and they seem to be growing bigger. And so I have recently planted some uh, in an area that is a little bit moister than where I had them before and they seem to be doing better. Uh, so it, sometimes it's surprising uh, how plants do when you translate it to the garden. But I found that these plants are very, very easy from seed. The main problem with growing them is finding a source for the seed. I did get seed from Geoscapes, which is the guy in, uh, 
uh, Idaho, but he's out and has been out for a couple of years out of seed. So there is no seed source for these other than that that I know of. And there should be because I don't think there's any shortage of seed and there's certainly no shortage of plants. So in the Brassicaceae family, all the seeds that I've grown have been very, very easy. So the uh, Arisimum, this is Arisimum uh, capitatum, which I grew from seed from Western native seed. So this isn't, this isn't the type here that's native here, but there are some very similar ones native here. Good luck finding seed though. Uh, this is a Bokera, which is used to be an Arab Arabus, um, but they're, they've been split off. So these are very, very easy from seed. These, these came, are seeds that were sown this year. Again, this was a species from the North American Rock Garden Society. It's an Arabus uh, from All Plains, the, the good seed company in Colorado. So moving on from the Brassicaceae family, there's the, um, uh, these are now Veronica's. They used to be uh, sin, uh, something, <laughs> Syntheris. This used to be Syntheris, Missourica. It's now Veronica, Missourica. And it's a plant that I don't know why every nursery isn't selling this plant because it looks good in a pot and it's, it, it grows easily in most gardens. It doesn't require extra dry, dry soil. Um, it's, this particular one is native to the mountains, uh, mostly eastern, east of, in part of the state, but there is a form native in the Columbia Gorge. And it has beautiful, very early flowers, the blue flowers. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful plant that should be grown by nurseries, but isn't, unfortunately. And again, seed of this is not really available most places. I have collected seed from my own plants. Um, so I'm growing it and growing it from seed and it doesn't appear to be at all difficult from seed. And on, on the Syntheris uh, front, or it's hard to keep calling these Veronica's, I remember them as Syntheris. This is uh, Veronica Shazantha. And this is a fairly rare plant. It's native uh, to the Western part of Washington and Oregon, uh, but it's a beautiful plant. And again, it's one that should be grown, not difficult to grow. Um, and it would do well, I think in most nurseries because it has not only the beautiful flowers, but the beautiful foliage. And it's again, not a difficult plant to grow. So if seed were available, I'm sure that it would be grown. And there's the flower of Syntheris schizantha. So uh, I'm sure everybody has heard of Lewisia's. Uh, Lewisia rediviva is the one that is harder to come by than most other ones. Um, this is one in my garden. They grow perfectly well in gardens here as long as it's well-drained. And as I mentioned before, uh, the best place to get them is from Native Ideals, which is in Montana, because there is no Washington source for seed of Lewisia rediviva. Uh, very easy from seed. All Lewisias that I've grown have been extremely easy. So this is rediviva. These are second year plants. Uh, I found that they're very, very tiny if you try to pot them up after the first year. So it's best to wait till the second year to pot them up. Lewisia rediviva is not a large plant to begin with. And Lewisiopsis, um, which is endemic to the Wenatchees and uh, adjacent areas, uh, is a beautiful plant. Everybody wants it. Very easy to grow, but very difficult to maintain in a garden, I've found. So this is Lewisiopsis uh, tweedii. These are the seedlings. And you notice on the label that I got this seed from Gelito, the German company, because again, there is no source for seed of this endemic plant, no source in the state of Washington uh, from any seed company. 
I should mention something about how difficult this is to grow. If you live in Wenatchee, it's not difficult to grow. <laughs> Only if you live in Port Angeles. I mean, Port uh, Ludlow is it difficult to grow. Uh, I found probably the best way to grow it is in a pot. Fraseria. Fraseras are, um, they are gentian relatives and there are uh, three species in Washington. This is Fraseria al albicollis. Uh, Bar Columbiana. This is found uh, at um, Columbia Hills State Park in the Columbia Gorge. A beautiful, beautiful plant, very substantial uh, foliage, very, very beautiful blue gentian like flowers. And this is one that, again, no seed is available um, from this, no seed of this is available that I know of. There is seed of other uh, forms of this, not the Columbiana form, but other forms from the North American Rock Garden Society uh, seed exchange. And there are some forms, there's some species of Fraseras that are available elsewhere, but this particular one seed is not available. But as you can see from the picture, this would be a very good garden plant. And it has been grown by uh, Seven Oaks native plants as a wholesale uh, crop, so it, it's growable. Uh, but like all gentian relatives, it's very slow from seed. You're, you're talking three or four years from seed before you even have a viable plant to plant out. There's another backlit picture of it. And so these, are, these were some seeds that uh, were coming up last year the, of albicollis. This is the one I got, I think, from uh, the North American Rock Garden Society. So it was a different form of albicollis, but to the untrained eye, it wouldn't look much different from the Columbiana form. And one of the plants I most lust after is Fraser uh, fastigiata, which is native to Eastern Washington and in, onto Idaho and probably parts farther than that. Uh, it looks like a when you see pictures of it, because I've never seen it in person, it looks like a uh, gentian on steroids. Uh, it's a fairly tall plant and it grows in kind of moist meadowy conditions. Uh, it would be very good, I think, in a garden. And I did get one to grow. Uh, this was its third year last year. And I made the mistake of putting it into a different pot right before our very hot spill and it died, which was a great tragedy. But anyway, I grow, I grow these from seed. And the problem with them is you don't get very many seedlings from a batch. And so, I, while I never uh, do special things with seeds um, in the past, I'm considering perhaps using some uh, gibberellic acid, uh, which is, I would make a, 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 a solution of it and pour it over the seeds. Uh, because that's what I've been informed might be a way to go. Uh, I've never tried it though, so I don't know. It might increase the germination rate. Uh, and I've gotten seed from All Plains. If All Plains goes out of business as they are reported to be about to do, uh, then this seed would not be available anywhere. And that, uh, this is Fraser uh, speciosa, which is, um, sometimes called the monument plant, uh, very impressive uh, white flowers when it flowers, but it takes it a number of years before it flowers, but it looks like it would have a very nice base and before it flowered. So you'd have nice foliage before it flowered. Um, and as you can see, I've never had any trouble germinating these. They germinate quite easily. And you can get seed of this from uh, Western native seed. You can see this uh, in person if you go down to the Steens Mount to Steens Mountain. And Adelinia ground, which is uh, used to be a cynoglossum, sometimes called hound's tongue. You see this in the Columbia Gorge, uh, sort of in oak woodland areas, and it 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 also exists on down into California. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. And when I first saw it, I thought some, somebody's garden plant had escaped because it looked so much like a 
a fancy garden plant, but no, this is a native and it's almost never grown by nurseries. But again, not a difficult plant to grow. I've obtained seed from Klamath native seeds. Um, they're the only source I know of to get seeds of this. But it does grow in the Columbia Gorge. And here are, these are first year seedlings coming up. So they do very well from seed. Uh, this, uh, in the first picture I showed, uh, there were some yellow flowers. That was Rhaenyra stricta, which is a plant in the, uh, it's an aster relative, uh, and it's the single plant in its genus. Uh, and this uh, is in very common up near uh, Sunrise, Mount Rainier. Beautiful plant because the foliage is so great. And then those yellow flowers are just a bonus. I got some seed of this and grew it last year and it, it did very well from seed, not, not at all hard. Uh, most Aster family members are not difficult from seed. So there you see it with uh, Castileas, Castilea miniata. Uh, and also you see some, um, looks like some sort of aster thrown in there. Uh, this is at Sunrise, Mount Rainier. And another must have, uh, Olsinium douglasii, a uh, grass widow. This is in the Columbia Gorge. These also grow in other areas of the Pacific Northwest. They grow up on Vancouver Island. Um, they grow down in the Siskiyous. Um, this particular plant has received an award of garden merit from the uh, Royal Horticultural Society. So it's one of those native plants that had to go overseas to be uh, recognized, but it's a great plant because it blooms so, so early. Uh, I have the, some of these blooming in my garden now. Not at all hard from seed as you see this mass quantity of them coming up in the seed pots. This was last year. And Dodecathions, another one. Oh, these are primulas now. I should correct myself, uh, but I'm still calling them Dodecathions. They seem more distinctive that way. Um, these are also extremely easy from seed. And when you see them in the wild, you often see a lot of them together. This is uh, in the Willamette Valley in a fairly wet meadow. Notice that it's not in woodland. This is in the Columbia Gorge, probably a different species. And this, although you can't see it because it's not a good picture, the, the purple you see in this picture is all dodecathions. And this is uh, in the Scablands uh, in Eastern uh, Oregon, sort of past the Dalles, east of the Dalles, uh, down near um, Cottonwood Canyon State Park. And there were just millions and millions of these dodecathions out in the Scabland desert, high desert area, in an area where you normally don't think of dodecathions being, but it just goes to show you, they are often seen in sunny positions, not in woodland, like some people tend to think of them as. And dodecathions, extremely easy from seed. I've tried a number of different species and they're all very, very easy. This is a picture of them in the seed pot. Uh, Balsama rises, uh, quintessential Eastern Washington plant. But this particular one is the Western version, uh, Balsama rises deltoidea, which I found is relatively easy from seed. Again, the seed is not particularly easy to come by, but if you could find it, they're not hard to grow from seed. It's just they take a long time to get big. Uh, I was told by somebody uh, once that. Uh, you need to wait about 10 years before they flower. I think they'll flower a little earlier than that, but you do have to wait a while before they make a good bulk. And another easy plant, almost a weed in my garden is what's now known as Erythranthe lewisia. It used to be um, Mimulus lewisii. There it is in my garden and it seeds itself everywhere. So. All you need to do is buy one plant of this and let it go to seed. And that's, you never need to sow it deliberately because it sows itself. Monardellas are another easy, easy plant. This is Monardella odoratissima, the only native Monardella to Washington state. This plant, however, was down in Oregon near the Rogue River. 
And of course, penstemons are also easy, easy plants from seed. Penstemon beretii from the Columbia Gorge. There it is near Catherine Creek. Penstemon davidsonii in, uh, on the trail to uh, Coldwater Lake in uh, Sunrise, Mount Rainier. Penstemon cardwellii near Mount, uh, Mount St. Helens. Penstemon rupicola near Coffin Mountain in Oregon. All of these are easy, easy from seed. And in fact, when I have plants in the garden, uh, they are always seedlings around the mother plant. Um, so there, and every time I've sown seeds, I get a full pot of seedlings. So they're very, very easy from seed. And again, the place to get seed, if you can't find it anywhere else, is to join the Penstemon Society and uh, get their seed exchange. And of course, Sedalces, very common plant uh, in the lowlands of Western uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, these also are almost weeds in my garden. Uh, once you have it and you let them self sow, you'll have lots and lots of plants such as this uh, Sedalce here. And alliums, uh, again, some of them are almost weedy. This one isn't, this one I like uh, quite a bit. This is Acuminatum. Um, but there are some, the nodding onion allium cernum is, can be uh, very, it, it sows itself quite a bit. So it can be a nuisance in the garden. This particular one would never be a nuisance because it's so beautiful. This, and this one doesn't sow quite as much as uh, cernum. And areogonums, also easy from seed. This is areogonum that I grew from seed, ovatifolium. This is Areogonum compositum in my garden. This one seeds around a little, not, not so it's a problem, but uh, I found all Areogonums seed to some extent. Calicortis, um, easy from seed, but again, it's a long-term project before you get a blooming plant. These are Calicortis seedlings. You, you have to wait I would say at least three years, maybe five years before you have, you'll have bloom on a plant that you've grown from seed, but well worth it because they're not easy to come by in nurseries. And Areophyllum linatum, um, this is one I would direct sow in a garden. It's so easy from seed. Quintessential Northwest plant. And Spherocephalum uh, monroana, this is near uh, the Painted Hills in um, Oregon. A beautiful plant, but when I've tried to grow this in, in my more Western garden, uh, it usually doesn't look quite this full, but if it ever did, it would be quite the sight. Easy from seed. And of course, bare grass, uh, another easy from seed plant. This was uh, taken at Coffin Mountain, which is sort of near Salem um, in the Cascades a couple of years ago when they had a big super bloom of, of bare grass. Very, very easy from seed grow bare grass. The main thing is it requires a fairly long, cold, moist stratification period. I think Klamasiskiu says 90 to 120 days. And then there are annuals, uh, which I direct so, uh, so we shouldn't forget them. Clarkias, I have a lot of Clarkias in the garden. These are Clarkia seedlings, Clarkia amonum, amona. There's Clarkia amona in bloom in my garden. And I started with, I just scattered the seed in the garden. I got a few plants the first year and then more every year after that because I let them go to seed. And this is, um, Madia elegans, They're the yellow flowers, Madia elegans, another native annual, very good for pollinators. It could be a nuisance in the garden, I've noticed. It seeds itself quite a bit. This is um, rosy plectritis, plectritis. Um, and there you see it at, uh, this is the wildlife refuge near Salem, a basket slough wildlife refuge, and you see uh, Castalia levisecta popping up through it. And I've, I also scattered seed of this in my garden and uh, it has done well. And I think it's eventually 
going to look like that minus the Castilia levy secta. So anyway, um, that's just a survey of some of the plants that I think are good garden plants that should be grown from seed. Um, but there are many that I left out. Uh, I couldn't possibly cover them all in one lecture. So anyway, I can end screen sharing now. Linda, that was amazing. I learned a lot. Okay. <laughs> I'm familiar with all those plants, but not with growing them. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm glad we recorded that because there's so much information. I think it'll yeah. be worth watching again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've been uh, writing down some questions from the chat and the Q&A. So I'm going to just kind of read them and uh, let you give short answers because we're already at 8.30. Um, there were a couple questions about the medium that you use to start the seeds. Somebody asked if you can use coconut coir, or have you ever done that? I haven't. I, you know, I think that what medium you use is not all that important as long as it doesn't break down too quickly and as long as it doesn't hold too much moisture. So yeah, coconut coir, I would experiment with if, if somebody was interested in it. And several people asked about grit. What what exactly is poultry grit and where do you get it? Okay, poultry grit is used for poultry. Uh, it has something to do with uh, something about their gizzards or <laughs> I'm not a yeah, poultry expert. I was so. thinking their crops. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you get, I got that bag uh, from uh, uh, tractor supply, but you can also get it from most farm supply stores. Uh, and, and the thing to get is poultry grit and not chicken grit because the poultry grit is slightly larger. And, and then they said, how much, how deep is, should you put the grit layer? Is it just a single layer on top? Well, that's what I did in years past. I just, I just put, in years past, I put the, um, the medium, put the seed directly on the medium and then put the grit on top of that. This year I've changed it uh, and I've put the medium about halfway up the pot, then the other half is grit, and then on top of that I sow the seeds. And the, my reasoning for doing that is to emulate what happens in a gravel pathway, because in gravel pathways you usually get a, an incredible number of seedlings. And so, and so far I've gotten good germination uh, from those plants that have germinated. Uh, you know, they, they'll, their, their roots will go down through the grit and come to the medium and get nutrients from the medium. I assume that's what will happen. Now, if I, for things like uh, Pedicularis Greenlandica, which is the moisture lover, I don't think I would do it that way. In fact, for that, this year, I, sow, I used uh, my regular potting soil mixed with sand for Pedicularis Greenlandica, and I didn't use grit except for the covering on top of the, top of the pot. And I use that, the grit on top of the pot to cover the seeds in order to keep down liverworts and mosses, because those are a big problem uh, when you have seeds in pots for a lengthy period of time, which you generally do for these kinds of seeds, seed crops. Mm. Uh, in the past, I used just sand instead of uh, the grit and the liverworts were a big problem. So the grit generally keeps those down quite a bit. Somebody said that some grit is, has calcium in it. So maybe that there's a chemical. There uh, could be. Interaction uh, with the this, mosses. Yeah, there could be. And, and I've noticed plants not, I mean, I haven't noticed anything bad with natives, but I've noticed with some plants that are not natives, when I used more grit, I had more problems such as uh, Selmesias, which are New Zealand alpine plants. I noticed a problem when I was using the grit and I, I've considered that there must be something in the grit that's causing that. The, the grit itself is granite. So, um, you know, it could affect the pH, but so far I haven't noticed that it's had any adverse impact on natives. And I know a lot of other growers that use that grit. Okay, thanks. Um, there were a couple questions about what a host plant is, and I think it might've gotten answered by chat and you mentioned it also, but you want to just say a word about that? 
Yes, uh, plants that are hemiparasitic, like Castileas and uh, Pedicularis, uh, have have host plants where they have a type of root that can uh, basically burrow into the root of the host plant and get nutrients and water from the host plant. Uh, they don't. They're unlike true parasites because they can make their own chlorophyll and uh, they can live on their own without doing that. But studies have shown they do better when they have a host plant. Uh, the question in my mind always is, maybe they can do better with the host plant if they aren't fertilized. But if you fertilize them and water them, uh, will they do just as well as a plant with a host plant? And I don't think that study has been done. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions about him, my parasites, right. to be frank. <laughs> yes, and I know that some of them have actually a fungus that connects the root of the parasite to the root of the host. So. Yeah, and I was wondering, you know, my difficulties in growing Pedicularis uh, densiflora that brings to mind perhaps there's some sort of fungal relationship there that, that I'm not aware of or that's not being met. They're easy to, to get to at least second year stage, but I've never been able to get them beyond that stage. And I've, I've heard from other people that they've had the same difficulty. And so that might be what's going on. Mm. But again, we don't know at this point. <laughs> um, someone mentioned that, uh, that he or she had seen L Lomatium columbianum at Humble Roots Nursery in Mosier, Oregon. And I think I've seen yeah. it there also. Yes, and yes. She, and she thought that it might have seeds also. So that was- Yes, hum Humble Roots does advertise that they will do contract uh, seed collecting, I believe. So that would be a source uh, for Lomatium columbianum seeds. It would be nice to have a more local source. We shouldn't have to go to Germany to get Lomatium right. columbianum seeds. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Um, somebody else wanted to know where you can get the seed for the grass widows for Alcinium. I've gotten seed from uh, Klamasiskiu. So that means that they would be collected in the Klamath region. I don't know where you can get seeds uh, more locally, uh, but again, humble roots might be the place to ask because they grow that. And so they could probably collect seed for you if you wanted. Yeah. Nards also um, has seed, yeah. And what was the name of the used to be Synthrus that, that has the purple flowers that you say everybody should have in their garden? I didn't get that one either. Oh, that's Missourica. I may not have said the whole name. That's Missourica, and there's uh, Missourica var stellata, which is the um, Columbia Gorge form. Uh, and the main difference is the scalloping of the leaves is more on the Columbia Gorge form than the than the other one. M I have both. Missourica. And what's the, what's the species name? Um, Veronica Missourica. Oh, Veronica Missourica. Yeah. What, yeah. Veronica now. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that person saw that. But it, it doesn't come from Missouri. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, let's see, are there any riparian plants that you grow from seed? Well, if you call uh, Pedicularis greenlandica a riparian plant, uh, yes, but I lowland riparian plants you know, those would not be hard to grow from seed. Uh, they, in fact, it, it has occurred to me a number of times, Pedicularis green, why Pedicularis greenlandica is found at higher elevations and not in the lowlands, because certainly it's wet enough in the lowlands for it to grow. And after growing it, my theory is that it's because of competition. In the lowlands, when you have wet areas, there is so much competition for that space that uh, something like uh, Pedicularis greenlandica would just be uh, smothered. Because in, in the areas like at Logan Valley, which is kind of their old fields that it's growing in, the grass isn't very thick. And that's probably because of the elevation. That makes sense. Huh. Um, there was also a question early on about what are the restrictions of co collecting seeds on public lands? Or do you, I, you, I believe I, you may know more about it than I yeah. do. I know you're not supposed to do it in the national parks, right? 
Uh, and uh, I think you have to have a permit on public lands, but I'm not, I'm not up on that. I, I, I are you, technically you know, you're supposed to have a permit in national forest land and I don't know um, county parks and BLM land and things like that. I'm not sure. And Kathy, do you know that? I don't. Um, I know you can, the Forest Service does have permits so you can collect plants, yeah. but I'm not sure what the rules are about seeds. And it might um, be hard to find the seeds. Yeah, I, I mean, collect, I think the reason that it's almost easier to buy from a, a collector who's who does that all the time is because it's all about timing, right? Right. And right. you want to get seeds that are ripe and getting out to the plant and recognizing it and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah you have to you have to know where the plant is. And so you really have to visit at least twice to know where it is and then to come back when it's the seed is ripe mm -hmm. and sometimes that's a hard thing to do if you're just an individual mm -hmm. right yeah uh, I bet Forrest um Shomer could help us with that information oh, yes. <laughs> is, is he on this call I don't know um, <laughs> but he's do inside you ever present. have a garden walk in your garden <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, you know my garden is very small <laughs> you know that yeah uh it's done it really, uh, I mean, people can drive by it <laughs> and see almost the whole thing. <laughs> so no, I, I don't have tours or garden walks. I could probably do something if somebody was really interested, uh, but it's not something I, I do much. I, in my old garden, I had a lot of those things and uh, I got kind of tired of being a slave to the garden. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to show the garden to people who are really interested, but don't expect a garden that has lots of grand vistas or anything because it's just a very, very small lot. <laughs> the photos lie. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see, what else? Um, do you, um, somebody asked about how much light you give the seedlings? Well, I check under those sandwiches, those Anderson flat sandwiches, I check quite often because I love to watch seeds come up. <laughs> and so I don't, if, they, if I see them germinating, I usually take them out of the flat um, so they get more light. Yeah. And I found the birds, the birds tend to leave them alone at that stage when they're starting to come up. Okay, I'm gonna give you uh, two more questions and then we're gonna end. Um, <laughs> A couple of people asked, where do you get the dodecathion seed? That's available from a lot of places. Uh, I get, uh, I've gotten some seed from Klamasiskiu. Uh, they, I think they have dodecathion hendersonii. Uh, uh, Gelito, the German seed company, has quite a few dodecathions of different species. Uh, some, not all of them native to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and I know that other local growers probably have them. I would, I would check with, for example, um, uh, the one, the Port Townsend Seed Company um, to find out if they have them. I would, wouldn't be surprised if they do. I mean, a lot of native seed companies have them. Okay, and then one last thing that actually might be helpful to a lot of people. Someone asked if you have any of this information in written form because she didn't catch all the names because she's <laughs> new to it. Um, <laughs> and have you ever made a list of, you know, these are the species that I work with and, and uh, what they're I haven't, with. other than uh, Castilleas, I made a list of those. And I do, I did write an article for the North American Rock Garden Society this I, on castilleas and there's art, there's information there on germination of castilleas and so that's in the latest quarterly of the North American Rock Garden Society and you have to be a member to access that at this point um, but I haven't made anything written on uh, what else I do although I'm considering doing it uh, doing something written about what I consider garden worthy but showy but little known garden worthy native plants. Well, we will look forward to that when it happens. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Somebody said, oh, it's the same person said, yes, please write that. We'd love it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we got most of the questions. There was one um, more I think that is super relevant. Um, LF, Linda, Lisa Foster wrote, can yeah. you say more about the length of time these plants are in the pots before potting yeah. and transplanting? Um, and what time of year do you transplant to the garden? Is it to vary between yeah. species or? It, it varies from species to species. It varies on how fast a species will grow. Most of the bulbs uh, are in the pots for more than one year, often as many as three years before they would be big enough to plant out. And uh, Olsinium douglasii would be in the pot for at least two years before they're potted up individually. Uh, Lewisia rediviva would be in the pot for two years. But a lot of other plants, if they grow, are faster growers, such as uh, Adelinia grande would uh, be potted up the same year that it germinates and probably planted in the garden either that same year or the next year. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on how fast the plant is growing, how big it's going to get. That's mm -hmm. why you have to write your article. <laughs> or, or sounds like a book, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it does sound like a book. Okay, I think it's uh, getting late and we really have appreciated your talk, Linda, and your time. Um, that was fascinating and beautiful photos too. So yeah, I well, thank you very, very much. Um, and I encourage everybody to uh, check our newsletter and our um, emails that come out from the chapter for other events that are going on. And this, so, this has been recorded. So everybody will have an opportunity to share it and listen to it again if you wanna catch more of the details in writing. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much, Thanks Linda. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Okay.